Hello, welcome to Grand Rounds at UCLA. I'm Jennifer Cruz, and I am delighted to have the honor of uh, introducing uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Pushpa Raja today, um, who is a leader, researcher, and educator in um, our department and at the West Los Angeles VA, and really doing work that is uh, nationally impactful. Um, Dr. Uh, Pushpa um, and I met as interns um, when we joined the UCLA um, a residency that was back in 2009. And, and since then, she's done um, uh, quite an extensive amount of, of uh, additional training and um, work. So she um, has completed a Master of Science in Health Policy and Management from the UCLA Fielding, Public, um, Fielding School of Public Health. Um, and also she uh, did the National VA Quality Scholars Fellowship, which is a three-year training program in quality improvement methods, implementation science, and health services research. Um, and her talk today uh, is titled A Practical Lens on Measuring and Advancing Care Quality in Mental and Substance Use Disorders, um, drawing from her extensive expertise and, and research in this area. Um, her um, roles and, and research um, span, you know, um, go across um, fields, um, a lot of healthcare policy, quality um, work within psychiatry and in, even in other fields such as neurosurgery with publications in high impact journals. And then in terms of her like day-to-day -day role, she's um, chief of quality and population health at um, the VA, uh, Greater Los Angeles um, Healthcare System, Department of Mental Health. Um, leading and coordinating improvement work across clinical data and operations teams to advance quality and access across mental health services for nearly 30,000 veterans annually. Um, and she's also serves as a consultant uh, for um, a, a group called Healthcare in Action, advising on strategy and program innovation um, for a startup addressing homelessness in Southern California as well as a uh, contract researcher at Harvard University School of Medicine and RAND Corporation, focusing on telehealth utilization and quality nationally with, with publications in, in this area. Um, she's also a clinician, uh, a colleague of mine at the Primary Care Mental Health Integration Clinic um, at the VA and in West Los Angeles. And um, uh, again, uh, just a, a wonderful person. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Raja. Um, uh, uh, we're sure to be engaged um, in, a, in a wonderful talk. All right. Thanks, Pushpa. Thanks so much, Jen, for that really nice introduction. It's such a treat to see you on here. And thank you all so much for having me today. I'm going to share my slides. All right. And we're gonna to talk today about quality measurement in mental health and substance use disorders, and really about how we can create meaning for measurement. So I think a really important question to kick this off is why? Why do we measure quality? And instead of starting with literature, I wanted to start here. I wanted to start with a patient example. And this is an example that comes uh, from one of our addiction specialists here at the VA, Dr. Lawrence. And the context in which he shared this was, he had been asked to lead work around a performance measure related to increasing evidence-based medication use for individuals with opioid use disorder. So he was launching this new hospital-wide group and he shared this example with them. So this is an example uh, around a veteran, Sean, we'll call him. So this is a veteran in his 30s and he had, a, he had a history of pretty bad back pain related to a military injury. He began using opioids that were prescribed to him. He was prescribed hydrocodone over the short term, but ended up transitioning to non-prescribed fentanyl. And use increased over the course of a year to one to two grams inhaled daily. He himself actually started to get worried about this escalating use, but he kind of wasn't sure where to turn. He was living in an area about two hours outside of Los Angeles. He was somewhat connected with the VA, but not very, it didn't feel yet like a tight connection and his use continued. He ended up being seen in an outside emergency room for an accidental opioid overdose. At that emergency room, 
he was offered a seven day buprenorphine prescription, um, but there wasn't any real clear plan for follow up. And he honestly had some concerns about taking this medication. So what happened? Well, this encounter he had in an outside ED ended up being identified by a team at our VA, the VA post-discharge team, as part of this new process they had launched. That team in turn notified the substance use disorder team. That substance use disorder team ended up reaching out and contacting the veteran for rapid intake through a new process they had developed. Um, and the patient again expressed, you know, I'm not sure about starting buprenorphine. But the STD provider who reached out, talked him, to a, talked him through a plan. They started buprenorphine over the phone. He sent out additional refills. He sent out comfort meds. Six months later, this veteran was stable on buprenorphine. He was engaging with the STD clinic, maintaining a relationship there. He had maintained employment. He'd got been, gotten back into exercise. He had strengthened relationships with his family and he had not returned to fentanyl use. So this example, going back to that question at the top of the slide, why do we measure quality? There's a lot packed into this example of how that patient level experience can kind of help us see more clearly um, and you know, even intuitively feel the reasons we measure quality. And there were multiple steps in this process that got the patient from a place of struggling with fentanyl use to stable relationships, um, employment, recovery, and several of these steps. A lot of these sequential clinical interventions were not steps that always existed in our care process. And these were all actually fairly new processes um, and teams and creative initiatives that were developed by managers and frontline staff, supported by leaders that directly aligned with, <coughs> excuse me, with national performance metrics. So the post-discharge team that was referenced, this was designed and developed about five years ago um, in response to a national performance metric within the VA that was aimed at rapid engagement with outpatient mental health services after patients were discharged from inpatient or residential mental health care. The rapid SUD um, intake that was referenced. So this was an effort that our SUD clinic, substance use disorder clinics, took on in part because it aligned with a metric that was nationally prioritized around increasing access to specialty substance use disorder services. Um, and also because it really aligned with the clinic's values um, and the evidence it, that they were seeing and that's in the literature, the patients who are seen more quickly are more likely to engage. Um, and ultimately likely to have better functional outcomes. Uh, the piece about initiating buprenorphine over the phone. This again was related to that measure, um, performance measure we have within VA, looking at medication use among patients with opioid use disorder. And one of the new care pathways that had been piloted related to that involved proactively outreaching to patients with opioid use disorder and high risk events like this gentleman and starting medication virtually, starting that engagement as quickly as possible. So I think it can be kind of easy um, and natural to think about quality measures as kind of these abstract mandates on high. But what I really like about this example is shows how in the right environment, efforts related to quality measures can make a real change for, for real patients kind of on their journey. And to me, that, that's really the reason to measure quality. We measure quality if there's meaning that can come out of that measurement. So we're gonna spend time today talking about how to generate meaning from quality measurement. If we think about healthcare delivery, um, and honestly, almost anything we experience as consumers, it's hard to argue that quality matters. Consumers in healthcare and outside of healthcare, consumers have a choice. And they, a lot of times, they're using signals of quality to inform that choice. In healthcare, people can go online to find quality data that hospitals publicly report so they can compare healthcare options. That's one way consumers can investigate quality. Um, people can also use the news to learn about great outcomes or problematic ones. Um, people can make choices and often do make choices based on word of mouth, even for healthcare. 
they'll ask how other people like this clinic or this hospital, they'll look online at social media um, or reviews and these opinions, which in effect reflect patient satisfaction and patient centeredness of a health system. These are real elements of quality too. So for health systems looking to bring patients in and looking to keep patients engaged, there's pressure around quality at a lot of different levels. But at the same time, providers and leaders in healthcare systems, they already have a lot on their plates to worry about. Um, the clinical complexity managed at each level of care has gradually increased over time. So patients who might've previously been admitted are now managed at lower levels of care. Documentation pressures can be time consuming. EHRs can help with billing capture and safety, but a lot of studies showing they can add time in terms of the documentation process. Uh, productivity pressures have increased in many settings. There are medical legal concerns. There are payer related pressures like prior authorizations. And so the question is, do performance measures end up as one more thing on this list, this list of burdens that I kind of viewed as one more pressure from on high? Um, it's an important question because performance measures aren't going anywhere. And in some ways, performance measures are mandates from on high. But before trying to answer this question, we're going to take a quick detour to make sure we have a common language about what performance measures are, where they come from, and some context about what they look like in mental health and substance use disorders specifically. So performance measures, what are they? Um, to start, I should say performance measures and quality measures, these are terms that are sometimes used interchangeably. Um, but sometimes there's a distinction made where performance measures are, are developed based on the highest level of evidence available or uh, expert consensus. And these are measures that are ready to use in formal care comparisons like value-based payments or public reporting. Um, whereas a quality metric can measure elements of care delivered and can be used for improvement, but may or may not meet that, meet that same high standard. Uh, when I'm talking about them today, I'm gonna try to mostly stick to performance measure, but like many people, I sometimes use them interchangeably. So, <clears throat> excuse me, at their most basic level, performance measures are ratios. They're kind of along the lines of what percent of X population got Y treatment or gave some particular response in a survey or had some particular outcome. And the intent is these ratios are used to quantify or measure healthcare structures or processes um, or outcomes that evidence shows are associated with high quality care or support one or more of uh, high level healthcare quality goals. In terms of the data that goes into these measures, some of the data going in comes from administrative data. Sometimes the data is manually abstracted from charts. Sometimes data comes from patient surveys, sometimes provider surveys. Sometimes it's electronic clinical data. So the data sources can be variable depending on the measure. Um, and then where do these measures come from? So there are several national organizations involved in uh, maintaining metrics for standardized evaluations and comparison of quality across systems. And some of the main organizations are listed here. So the VA, which has an Office of Performance, measure, performance Measurement, um, CMS, the Centers for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Services, the National Quality Foundation, the National Committee on Quality Assurance, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, um, and SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. All of these groups maintain metrics, performance measures uh, available for comparison of quality. And we'll touch briefly on the different concepts measures try to capture. So Donna Bedian, who is a health services researcher in Michigan, developed these three concepts you see on the slide to categorize quality back in 1965. And there's still a very common paradigm for thinking about what elements of healthcare quality a specific measure is trying to capture. So there are structural measures, and these are about innate descriptive characteristics of a provider or a hospital or health system that theoretically might be linked to quality, like does a health system have electronic prescribing or are most of the providers board certified, things like that. Uh, process measures are processes um, 
that are part of healthcare related activities or services. And usually these measures are looking at whether patients get specific care that's considered medically advisable based on evidence or expert consensus. So for instance, the percent of patients with depression who get uh, certain types of psychotherapy or the percentage of individuals who get an annual risk screening. <coughs> and then there are outcome measures. What happened to a patient's actual uh, health status? Did their depression get measurably better? Uh, did they have an infection after an operation? A lot of the performance measures that health systems are required to report on are often process measures. Um, and many people in the field of quality measurement think all three of these types of measures can be useful in combination, even while at the same time, none of them are necessarily perfect. Kind of similar to how statisticians say all models are wrong, but some are useful. No measure, no suite of measures will perfectly capture healthcare quality, but performance metrics can still be really useful. Uh, one more way to categorize healthcare quality or performance measures is by attributes. So some measures, some performance measures are defined by populations with certain symptoms, diagnoses, for instance, um, do patients with PTSD get certain evidence-based therapy, psychotherapy? Some measures look at modality. So um, some measures might look at psychotherapy specifically, some might look at med management, some might look at care coordination. Um, modality could also be telehealth versus in-person care. Um, some measures are defined by setting, so acute care or outpatient care. Sometimes measures are categorized by how they link to one of the six quality domains in the Institute of Medicine's Crossing the Quality Chasm paper back from 2001. So those six domains are safety, efficiency, effectiveness, patient-centeredness, timeliness, and equity. And sometimes we'll look at how, do, how does a given metric link to one of those domains. So there are different ways to categorize measures. And it's also useful to kind of get a sense of the mental health landscape of performance measures more specifically. So what's the scope of measures used to monitor quality within mental health and substance use disorders? A group of researchers, mostly from the VA, uh, but a collaborative in 2022, they took a pretty sweeping look at the breadth of performance measures related to mental health and substance use disorders from all of the six major national organizations that are involved in fielding measure repositories, those organizations we talked about earlier. And a couple of highlights of the work worth mentioning, um, <coughs> excuse me, they looked at over 4,400 measures. They found 635 that related to mental health or substance use disorders. Of those, there was a lot of overlap in concepts. And so they found that these could be condensed to 376 unique constructs. They found mental health measures were most often defined by diagnoses or symptoms. Um, the next largest category was experience of care. And then there were a large number of measures that related in some way to the inpatient stay. They found one in four of mental health and substance use measures were, were National Quality Foundation endorsed. The National Quality Foundation is an organization that performs um, independent reviews of of measures. So they'll look at valid validity, reliability, the evidence based behind a measure, and kind of give their endorsement stamp for those performance metrics. Um, and there were more NQF endorsed measures within CMS and the NCQA than there were within VA and SAMHSA. Among actively used measures, measures that were being actively used for national comparisons, they found a higher percentage of process measures than outcome measures. And most of the outcome measures were around experience of care. So based on um, data like patient surveys. They also noticed some gaps in the breadth of measures. So there weren't a lot of measures covering certain evidence-based treatments. So not a lot of measures around psychotherapy, particularly for certain conditions. Um, they noticed that certain diagnoses weren't covered, anxiety, very few measures. Um, and they noticed gaps in covering certain quality domains, certain of those Institute of Medicine quality domains, like equity and safety. So this was kind of what they found about today's state of monitoring quality for mental health. 
And I've been talking about monitoring quality. I've been using the term monitoring, the tools used to monitor care quality. But now I wanna go back to the pet question from before. Is there a way to make quality measurement something more than monitoring or a burden or a mandate? Is it kind of, is it possible to create a culture where people feel like measurement around care really aligns with their personal values um, and it doesn't feel like an externally imposed burden? Um, and this isn't a question that's unique to health systems, by the way. It's a question that's explored in work um, in the business literature pertaining to multinational corporations. But in healthcare, quality measurement, like we saw, comes down from this kind of alphabet soup of anonymous feeling organizations. How do we take those measures and attach meaning and grow a culture around quality? So there's a body of literature around how to move organizations towards a quality culture where quality and safety are supported, they're celebrated. And we're gonna pull out this one major framework today. So this slide shows the Institute for Healthcare Improvement or the IHI framework for safe, reliable and effective care. Uh, the IHI is one of the largest and earliest foundations looking at healthcare delivery, healthcare services. Um, this model was developed with a lot of stakeholder involvement. And the main concepts are, they're kind of two foundational domains, the culture, of a healthcare setting and the learning system or the ability for continuous learning in a setting. And then there's subdomains you see in each one like psychological safety and teamwork as parts of culture and transparency um, and measurement as key elements of learning system. And there are a lot of other similar frameworks like the Joint Commission has a framework around healthcare maturity, high reliability maturity, um, there are other learning health system models. They all have slightly different emphases, but if you pull out some of the overlapping concepts, you start to see some key elements emerge. So these are the elements that you start to see across multiple models is really important to creating a culture, a system where quality is more of an internal drive versus an external pressure. So leadership buy-in, leaders who are conveying that quality is a priority and um, support employees spending time doing training around quality improvement, doing spending their creative energy on improving quality. That's considered a key element across most of the models that you'll see. Team and peer engagement is another element. Um, so when employees see each other bringing up quality routinely, when team members are helping each other in quality related activities, when they're holding each other accountable for improving care, that's an element that really supports moving towards a culture of quality versus monitoring or mandated quality. Employee ownership is also important and mentioned across multiple frameworks. So employees who are given time and space to lead efforts around quality, uh, making decisions, feeling safe to question practices around quality. The next one is democratized data. So access to data. And a lot of frameworks talk about this. They talk about the importance of access to data the, important, uh, the importance of getting reliable, usable data from the hands of a small number of administrators to the teams working on improvement and really allowing teams to dig in, understand, um, and use data throughout the process of improvement. And finally, goal credibility and transparency. So really working to make sure messaging around quality goals is easy to understand and feels relevant to people involved and making sure that data about outcomes is shared and transparent. So the information from these conceptual frameworks then helps us, whether we're providers or managers or healthcare operations leaders or researchers, think about how do we move performance measures off of that list of healthcare burdens onto the list of, of things that people find living in a more meaningful space about delivering care. And so using examples, we're gonna talk about three ways that this can happen. The first is performance measures in the right environment can really be tools to spur creativity and care delivery from teams within a system. So to illustrate this first way, kind of of using performance measures as a tool, we'll dig into an example from BA. And this example again is around opioid use disorder treatment. So opioid use, as you know, is a growing epidemic nationally. Um, but it turns out that treatment is in fact incredibly effective. Medications can reduce overdose and can dramatically improve people's function and well-being. 
but there's a big gap. Many people with opioid use disorder are not on treatment. And in line with this, VA, similar to other national organizations, has a performance measure that monitors of a population at a given VA with an opioid use disorder diagnosis, what percent of them are receiving evidence-based medication treatment. Um, VA performs better than some of the national data outside of VA. National VA 50th percentile is around 48%, and VAs nationally get data on this um, on a quarterly basis. From a national perspective, um, this measure and kind of a larger suite of measures around care for substance use disorders and controlled substances was the impetus for this national team to create a usable dashboard, usable by any site across the VA, that allowed clinicians to quickly identify patients falling out of various measures in real time to get information about their current status that might be able to help link them to care. But really care happens locally. So we'll walk through how two different health systems within the VA use this performance measure as kind of a tool to spur change. We're gonna talk about the Greater Los Angeles VA, so down the street from you, and the Southern Arizona VA, the national top performer. So a few data points about these VAs. The Los Angeles VA sees about 70,000 vets a year. Southern Arizona sees about 50,000. They're both spread out across large geographic areas. Um, Greater Los Angeles, in terms of baseline data, was a little bit below the VA national 50th percentile and really trying to improve. Southern Arizona has been the top performer for quite a while. So at the Los Angeles VA, going back to some of those con conceptual framework elements important to facilitate a quality culture, clinicians felt aligned with the goal of the measure. Uh, clinicians wanted to increase the amount of medication among veterans with opioid use disorder. Performance measure baseline data was a signal that leadership looked at. It showed GLA's performance was lower than national and leadership bought in to the importance of improving this. They said, this is important. Let's dedicate some clinician time. The clinician lead, an employee, was empowered to run with this. He dug into the national dashboard, but he found a huge number of patients came up and wanted to think through, was there a way he could prioritize this? Because he had access and support around data. He was able to iteratively build a data tool that on a weekly basis identified people in the last week who'd had a high risk or critical clinical event related to opioid use, things like hospital admissions or ED, ED visits um, or overdoses who were people on, not on medication. And he used this weekly list to do quick chart reviews and then for appropriate patients, do this new, take on this new virtual outreach pathway. So here other team members would call a patient and say, hey, we saw you're not on medication. We saw that this event just happened can we tell you about medication or are there other ways that we can help you? So with this work, along with some data cleanup, the GLA team has been seeing some steady progress in engaging patients with opioid use disorder. Again, kind of spurred by the momentum around that performance session. If you turn to Southern Arizona, the highest performing VA in the system, um, you see some similarities in the stories. So clinical staff were aligned with the metric goal. Leadership bought in. They created a champion role. They increased resources over time. In this case, the champion used the dashboard that the national team, that national team we first saw had built, and they honed in on one of the functions, which was identifying patients currently on inpatient units who had substance use disorders or opioid use disorders. The champion, because of being given ownership, autonomy, ended up developing an outreach-oriented care pathway, similarly outreach-oriented to the last example, but this one was outreach-oriented consult liaison work with an addiction focus. With this work and also education work and capacity building among staff um, inside and outside mental health that they did in Southern Arizona, you see Southern Arizona all the way on the left of this graph in orange, while the green line in the middle is the national 50th percentile. So leaders and staff at both of these VAs kind of harness this mandated performance measure really as a tool for change within their respective systems. 
Leaders bought in, they supported employees. Employees in turn felt empowered to design new approaches to care, and they used data to facilitate their efforts and measure impact. So we're gonna to move to a second example now of how performance measures can be used as tools to generate insight. And it's actually applying these measures outside of their mandated use um, and using them in work that partners research and operations. So we can use performance measures as tools to help answer clinically important questions about care um, and make this happen through partnerships between research and operations. So oftentimes research happens in an area, healthcare decisions, healthcare operations decisions are made in the same area, but these don't connect as often as we'd like. And performance measures can be a tool to help to help promote really meaningful partnerships between healthcare operations and research, or even policymakers and researchers by kind of providing a common language, a language that matters, um, a language that has concrete ramifications to healthcare operations, and something to kind of build on to learn and make decisions. So these findings can often help inform policy and practice. And to illustrate this, we'll look at a relevant real world question. How has widespread implementation of telemental health impacted the quality of care being delivered? So at this point, most of you have probably delivered a lot of care via telehealth um, and telehealth works well for some populations, but maybe you also like others have had questions about how well it's worked for certain vulnerable populations. And one of these populations are those with serious mental illness. Serious mental illness is often defined as individuals with disorders like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. And this is a population that even before the pandemic, they experienced challenges with access to care. So the concern was, would telehealth further exacerbate these challenges? VA clinicians, as well as operations leaders, as well as some researchers were asking this question. And the set of VA performance measures mostly process measures around care for veterans with serious mental illness, uh, ended up being a tool to help answer this. So a group of us were, a group of us asked, and this was a non-funded research operations partnership, but one that really grew organically about feeling like this was important for us to know about our patient populations. We were asking, did facility level adoption of video visits have any association with a VA's performance on on SMI-related performance measures, on access and continuity of care for individuals with serious mental illness. So we looked at seven measures. Um, <clears throat> the VA has a suite of measures related to care for individuals with serious mental illness. They include what percent of a uh, health system's SMI population met an initial minimum threshold of engagement with various programs geared to the population. So things like uh, recovery-oriented IOPs, assertive community treatment, um, and then looking at what proportion gets continuous care at a higher level of intensity in these programs. So continuity of care, and also measures that look at receipt of psychotherapy, psychosocial services in this population, and primary care engagement and mental health continuity. So kind of a suite of various measures. And what we found was, while greater telehealth use um, didn't negatively impact initial access to certain types of care for SMI populations. It did appear to negatively impact continuity of care in several mental health services for individuals with serious mental illness, as well as their connectedness to primary care. So it suggested perhaps patients had been, who had been open to telehealth out of necessity were not particularly open to continuing care via telehealth in the long term within this population. And so this data and other similar findings really helped support discussions around potentially adding supports for individuals with serious mental illness um, who had to have their care over telehealth. So things like peer support for facilitated telehealth visits and also increasing in-person support for these individuals. And the national office also ended up making some shifts in the metric definitions where they scaled back the amount and the types of telehealth that could be counted towards some of these serious mental illness related metrics. 
So that's one example of performance measures being used to help answer operations questions through research and operations partnership. There have also been a lot of examples within OUD care, so we'll talk about one example here. So telehealth flexibilities, as many of you know, they were expanded during COVID-19 for controlled substance prescribing. So that requirement for an initial in-person visit was relaxed. But as that public health emergency went down, a big policy debate opened up about what were we gonna do going forward about those flexibilities? From the regulatory perspective, there were a lot of concerns about safety and risk. Things like were overdoses and overdose deaths more likely if prescribing buprenorphine over telehealth, maybe because there was less monitoring or more risk for misuse. On the flip side, health systems and providers expressed a lot of concerns about the risk to patients of scaling back those flexibilities. So this was another area where researchers could try to meet the needs of operations and policymakers. And researchers from the CDC and CMS took some of the SAMHSA measures around population rates of opioid-related overdoses to try to answer some of these safety questions. So a group led by Jones from the CDC, CMS, NIDA, they looked at a longitudinal cohort from CMS data between 2018 to 2021. And they looked for changes in overdose rates as telehealth flexibilities were put in place for controlled substances. So as people were able to do more opioid use disorder treatment prescribing over telehealth. The measures they used were, in, were aligned with SAMHSA metrics. And so in regards to the overdose question, when they compared pre-pandemic and pandemic cohorts, they found that the percent of deaths due to fatal overdose across the populations was similar pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, suggesting that the telehealth flexibilities didn't impact that particular metric, that particular outcome. Um, interestingly, they also found that care for opioid use disorder that was delivered via telehealth was actually associated with a 33% lower odds of fatal drug overdose. And this was even after adjusting for differences in care engagement and receipt of medication, uh, medication treatment for OUD. So those are typically what people might think would have been the intuitive drivers. But there seemed to be a link between engaging patients via perhaps a more convenient modality and lower risk of overdose. Um, there was also other research that adapted existing performance measures to look at the quality of care for opioid use disorder delivered via telehealth. So using metrics like medication initiation rates and retention rates. And this data along with advocacy networks helped kind of move discussion forward around this policy question. Earlier this year, some of the telehealth flexibilities for opioid treatment programs specifically were made permanent um, and office-based flexibilities continue to be extended further. So again, thinking outside of kind of the typical use of performance metrics when they're measuring care delivery in a given system, they can also be used as this common language for healthcare operations and researchers and policy makers when answering broader important questions about how care is being delivered. And so this brings us to a third way performance measures can be tools to generate meaning for providers or health systems engaging with the measures. And that is that measures themselves can be important subjects for evaluation. So how does this play out? <clears throat> performance measures, as we saw before, um, are pushed out from national organizations. They're these monitoring tools for comparisons. And sometimes measures intuitively resonate. Getting more patients on medication for OUD, a lot of providers feel a natural alignment with that. But other measures can have targets that feel kind of less intuitive to providers or to health systems. Maybe they feel more like requirements with, without as much of a clear rationale. But health systems still have pressures even around these kinds of measures, pressures like value-based payments or public reporting requirements that make them still have to think about what sort of resources do we need to dedicate here, even if we or our teams don't fully buy in. So for measures like these, as well as others, evaluations that look at things like, is success on a measure actually associated with some cl clinically meaningful outcomes? These can help kind of generate meaning in work related to a measure if there's impact found, and potentially lead to changes in the way a measure gets used if there isn't. 
So we're gonna talk about an example of a national VA post discharge metric to kind of illustrate this. So outside of VA, national quality metrics have existed in some form or the other since around 1999 to look at timely outpatient mental health follow-up after psychiatric hospitalization. Um, and they usually look at the proportion of patients receiving at least one outpatient mental health follow-up within seven days and within 30 days of discharge. So at least one visit. And the rationale for these measures was there was a higher risk of attrition, of readmission, of mortality, in the days and weeks after discharge. And there was a small supporting body of evidence around positive impacts of timely follow-up in that short term. So the VA rolled out a similar seven-day measure across our system, looking for, so similar to the community standard, um, the CMS metric. Uh, so we rolled out a measure across our system looking for at least one visit within seven days after mental health hospitalization or mental health residential treatment, and that started back in 2014. But by around 2017, the VA was finding pretty much all facilities were doing quite well on this measure. And there were also some changes during this period around suicide prevention policies that really emphasized more intensive touches for patients deemed at risk. So the VA post-discharge measure underwent a pretty significant change. So around 2017, the post-discharge follow-up period was extended to 30 days, but the measure changed from requiring one visit to requiring patients to have a minimum of two and up to four as a minimum outpatient mental health visits in that 30-day period, depending on their discharge location and their risk level. This was a measure that was prioritized by the national office. There was a large rollout, education, data, had a pretty high weight in the performance metric suite. And so for VA facilities, this was a big change um, and a big pressure, really. There was some pushback. So across different VAs, different teams and leaders questioned the lack of clear evidence for the increased number of visits when compared to community standard of one visit within 30 days. Also, within, also in 2023, because of more data from VA reporting comparable metrics to community, Facilities started to see their data on that 30-day measure that required just one visit, um, and it was meaningfully higher than performance on the VA measure for some facilities. So the question for facilities around this um, kind of boiled down to, number one, it's a lot of pressure to get patients two to four mental health visits in 30 days in an already stressed system. So the effort that we're pouring into these 30 days associated with any longer-term positive outcomes beyond the 30 days. And then number two, there were questions around the community standard versus VA standards. So stakeholders asked, is that additional number of follow-up visits we're requiring inside the VA associated with any additional benefit? Um, so this was analysis led by a research group at the Palo Alto VA, who I partnered with. And we were looking at patients discharged from measure qualifying stays between 2016 and 2019. And we created a propensity score model to help account for factors that could influence the likelihood of being in any particular group to develop four propensity matched comparison groups. So the four groups were group one, uh, so this is the reference group who had zero follow-up visits. So they didn't meet the community standard, they didn't be, meet the VA measure. Group two had only one follow-up visit in 30 days. So this group met the community metric standard, but not the internal VA measure. Group three, so this greater than one group, these were groups, these are people who had more than one follow-up visit but still didn't meet the VA measure. So for instance, uh, higher risk vets who were required to have four visits in 30 days but only had two or three. Group four were people who met the VA metric. So we then used mixed effects regression to look at associations between the level of post-discharge follow-up care and longer term outcomes across these cohorts. So we looked at outcomes after those first 30 days post-discharge that were deemed important both in the literature and by VA stakeholders. These were outpatient mental health or SUD services in the subsequent six months after the first 30 days. So do patients stay connected after all this effort went into getting them connected in the first 30 days? We also looked at outpatient primary care services in the subsequent six months. 
Um, and we also looked at all-cause mortality within 12 months of discharge. So if there was higher mortality in other literature in the first 30 days, and that was one of the rationales for this measure, how, what, what was happening beyond that? So those are the questions we were trying to ask. What we found was individuals who met the VA's internal, more stringent follow-up measure, as well as those who met the community measure, the one visit threshold, they both had meaningful differences in longer term outcome when you compared either group to the patients who didn't have any follow-up care in the 30 days post-discharge. So you can see on this table, the green, the yellow, and the light orange groups, they all had higher numbers of outpatient mental health visits, they all had more connectedness to primary care. They all had lower all-cause mortality compared to those in the dark orange group, the group with zero outpatient mental health visits in 30 days. But what was maybe even more compelling and relevant to VA stakeholders was, if you start from the bottom, um, and this is the same data, just kind of represented as odds ratios and a zero inflated negative binomial regression, you'll see that meeting the community measure of at least one visit in 30 days, that light orange and the yellow, it was better than the dark orange, so having no visits at the bottom, but meeting the more stringent VA measure requiring two to four visits, that was associated with the highest odds of primary care engagement over six months, the lowest odds of all-cause mortality, and the highest number of mental health and substance use disorder contact in the six months after the first 30 days. So this evaluation of outcomes associated with the national VA performance metric did suggest that the more stringent VA measure seemed to have greater benefit for veterans at least when compared to the less stringent community standard of one visit in that 30 day period. And these findings ended up being shared at various operational levels. So national performance measure, leadership, national mental health leadership, regional leadership, facility leadership, um, and so this data has just been helpful in creating meaning around a performance measure that really required a lot out of hospitals and a lot from VA as a whole. There were a lot of workflow modifications, a lot of resources dedicated. So it was really helpful to have evidence of the longer term clinical impact of this work that was being pushed out in those first 30 days post-discharge. So to wrap up, um, I was doing some reflecting as I was kind of working through this. I spent most of this talk on the ways we can move performance measures away from that list of healthcare burdens to a space where it feels meaningfully different from requirements like prior authorizations or coding. Um, but I do think it's important that to mention, sometimes it's very reasonable to be frustrated by performance measures. Sometimes they capture tiny populations and get very heavily weighted. Sometimes they don't exclude populations that some of us feel like they should. Um, there are entire areas of care not basically ignored by measures. Um, sometimes measures like we just talked about, they don't intuitively resonate. And I think it all goes back to this idea from statistics that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So any individual measure of quality and even any suite of measures of quality is going to be imperfect. All of them are quote unquote wrong in the sense that they will never fully capture every aspect of mental health quality. But I think that doesn't mean that it's not still worth trying. Performance measures can drive meaningful change, meaningful discovery, if they're approached as tools rather than mandates or edicts on high. And I think that piece is really important. They're tools. Performance measures with clinically relevant goals can be tools to spur creativity, to kind of galvanize change if leadership can be motivated to buy in, if employees are given room to lead, if data is accessible for these efforts. And this is kind of the use of performance measures that I find most meaningful and really fun when you're in a health system that puts work into creating a culture where caring about quality starts to feel innate rather than external. I've seen phenomenal creative energy from so many different people across so many areas creating meaningful change for patients. And there are other equally useful and important ways to kind of apply and bring meaning from these measures. They can be a common language for researchers and operations leaders when asking clinically important questions. Um, and the measures themselves can be tools to prod existing assumptions, to ask about whether success on a given measure is really associated, truly associated with clinically meaningful impacts. And so, I think I'll leave with this. Performance measures really are just tools. 
Don't fear them, use them. Thank you. Happy to take questions. That was so lovely, Pushpa. Thank you so much for an excellent talk. Um, so clear. Um, so um, starting off, um, what has been your experience? What have some challenges been in terms of, you know, getting buy-in from uh, various stakeholders? And and what's your advice to people sort of at various levels in terms of engaging leadership or teams, empowering employees around this and and helping it feel meaningful? And, and I know you spoke to to this, but but wondering if you have sort of um, some personal experiences, challenges, and, and thoughts on that. Um, I think some of the challenges are around timing and um, and healthcare organizational priorities. And I think really trying to sometimes align and find a linkage. Sometimes it doesn't have to be the most obvious linkage between work that's being done or being attempted or work that people are interested in doing at, at the frontline level and priorities at the organizational level, it doesn't always have to be the most obvious linkage, but trying to think about ways, are there ways that we can, in addition to this work that we're doing, um, capture it, and capturing can sometimes be the boring aspects, right? It can be the coding aspect, it can be the, um, and that can be like the diagnostic coding, it could be the billing, the procedural coding, that's the boring part, but it could be saying, are there ways that we can make the work that we do capturable in a way that aligns with our organization's priorities, our leadership's priorities. So I think sometimes the challenge is around um, timing and making sure that there is alignment with what a healthcare organization or the leaders care about in a given moment. I'd also say persistence is really important. I've seen projects where the initial go doesn't always take. For some reason, you don't have leadership buy-in. It isn't the thing that that leaders care about in that particular moment. But six months later, a year later, you go back to it and there is something that came up that made this really salient to leaders. So I think persistence sometimes can be really important in getting some of these initiatives off the ground. That's really helpful. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and from, you know, obviously from at a leadership level, um, part of this is uh, putting dollars into it, presumably. Right, um, uh, uh, because there's this tension between busy clinicians and employees who may be really interested in a particular measure or outcome, um, and wanting to invest time but not having really the ability to um, give in schedules. And and um, I, I suspect that's been something you've run into, and, and wondering about your experience with that. Yeah, I think that's such a good question, and it is, it is such a key point and honestly a reality of making improvement happen is that clinicians or interested stakeholders really do need the time. They do need time and efforts that don't allow people to have some amount of time carved out to these, these initiatives often fail because there isn't that energy that is able to be put into development and sustainment. Um, and I think it sort of goes back to those key elements that the framework points out, right? Like leadership has to buy in and say, hey, our performance here is important. And maybe it's important because we might get increased value-based payments based on our performance on these measures. Maybe it's important because we are being compared in the public sphere to other institutions on this data and we want to look better. There might be different reasons for leadership to buy in, but leadership has to buy in to saying employees can get training and employees can get time to do this work. Um, and employees should feel like they do have the autonomy and kind of support to do the work. I think it's really, those are really critical pieces for, for improvement to succeed. And um, some of the metrics have sort of a bottom line um, attached to them as well. You mentioned like value-based payments and kind of thinking about as, as one might pitch something kind of pulling in, like, this is what, you know, even though I find this really meaningful from X point of view, here's the dollars that might make it meaningful kind of thing. Exactly. And I, I kind of see that as part of my role. I think that for people in quality leadership, that is part of our role. A part of our role is saying, 
hey, let's link with these people in, for instance, liver clinic, who are really interested in getting better care, uh, get better alcohol use disorder related care for their patient population. And let's think about how can we support that effort in a way that aligns with national metrics that we as an organization care about? Can we shape it in a way that we that really aligns with that work and encourage this really cool excitement and interest in something innovative? How often do you find that um, people kind of are in their own, just kind of their own wheelhouse and resistant to sort of that kind of change and collaboration that that's required? Um, I think that, I think you see experiences across the gamut, but I would say that in an organization where, and this goes back to one of those five tenets, which was peer and team involvement, I actually think the access to data and seeing other people engaged around innovation and employment, uh, innovation and improvement, um, it often is like really self-perpetuating. People get excited about seeing their peers being able to have an impact that makes change it really goes back to that first example, right? Like you see that initiatives that people have put into place related to measures can actually have a very meaningful change at the individual patient level. Um, and I think that's very empowering and exciting for people to feel like I not only have power or control or influence, I think influence is the right word. I not only have influence in my own patient's lives, the patients I see one-to-one, but maybe patients across our systems, there is something I can do for them. So I think that often as people start to see more peer engagement and improvement, um, it's really self-perpetuating. There's a lot of interest and excitement about being part of it. I, I really thought that was a very helpful framework of the, the leadership, the teams, like at all of these levels, the transparency and how important all of this is in you know, ultimately the creation of meaning and um, impactful work, because um, uh, it you know part of leadership buy-in would be then helping to promote teams, right? And like the time for teams to kind of work. So very very helpful. Um, another uh, question we have is: um, Could taking away another process while adding more things to do, like more visits, engage clinicians more? Um, so I guess, you know, it's getting at so any research on deleting something that doesn't work, which I, I think that's a great question. Like how do we kind of, you know, try to pare down some of these things that maybe are interventions that aren't adding, uh, quality. Absolutely. Um, so some of you probably have heard about the lean framework, the lean model for improvement. And one of the key ideas in lean, which is basically kind of just a a structured framework around improvement activities. One of the key tenets of lean is identifying sources of waste. So what are things we do in our healthcare process that are wasteful? They don't add value, but we still do them. Are there ways that we can pull those out and make the process more efficient for the provider, more efficient for the patient? And so absolutely, improvement is not always about adding an initiative or adding a process, sometimes it can really be about identifying waste and removing those from our processes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, that was the last question that we have time for. I really appreciate such a wonderful talk, Dr. Raja. Um, and I, I suspect that uh, you may make yourself available if people have other questions and would like to reach out. Absolutely, please do reach out if there's anything anyone would like to talk about. Um, my emails on this slide. Thank you again for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Cruz, for hosting. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.